Do you want to hear? What do you think? <laughs> yes. So I want to know, just like you said that, you know, you're making incremental progress. Mm -hmm. So how are you tracking, I mean, beyond the learning outcomes, how are you tracking penetration among faculty? So like what percentage of faculty you're engaging with? What percentage of classes? Yes, yes. What that, percentage of students? Yeah, that was <laughs> a challenge because uh, we are, so far it's kind of uh, just word of mouth. Oh, I'm doing this and people reach out to Annie yeah. quite frequently. People come, come in and have an idea and I sit mm -hmm. with them and I, I morph that idea. How can we morph that idea? And I pull out those standards. Right. And um, they, some of them are not savvy enough to, on the technology, so I kind of swoop it up for them and make it look beautiful. Mm -hmm. and, and they feel good about it and they gain confidence. So next semester, be able to do it on right. our own a little bit better. Yeah, uh, Laurel has a comment, but uh, I want to say that that's also, we're still defining mm -hmm. for our faculty what digital learning really is. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the challenge for our ad hoc group right. to uh, have a some kind of process and document that one can say yes, no, yes, mm -hmm. no. And uh, that's part of our process. So the other thing I was going to say is I think that I, I kind of like the way that it has been more encouragement and it's a more carrot and less stick. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so one of the little carrots, I guess, that I think we forgot, I forgot to mention is uh, we also have a faculty retreat in January every year. And a number of those presentations also have been a chance for us who had started to incorporate this to share those ideas with other faculty members. And one thing we did this year, too, at that retreat was we asked people to, following the retreat, to just email saying, um, okay, what's one thing from this retreat that you think you would try? And that could be something really little, like trying Padlet once or um, you know, adding a glossary on Moodle, or even just posting PowerPoints to Moodle. Yeah, this is the digital learning. Yeah. Just letting so have a lot of opportunities to share. And then we also had somebody from our Center for Teaching and Learning that tried to follow up with those people at the end of the semester. Did you try that? And so, kind of, you know, again, no, no real consequence that people didn't, but having that, okay, I'm going to say that I'm doing this, and then that check-in. Uh, I think helps encourage people. And here's, a, who, here's who you can go to yeah. if you have questions about yeah. how to talk. Jenny, did you have a I, I had just a technical question. I'd like to know more about the outcomes in Moodle. Is that a plugin? Is it a, a, what version of Moodle? We have right now Moodle Rooms. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you use Moodle Rooms, but if you use Moodle Rooms, the reporting function is under the site administration. Mm -hmm. And you can uh, you just pull an Excel document and sort it. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can do it by course. And you can do it by uh, outcomes. And you can do it in a lot of different ways. And then finally, in your own course, as a teacher, you can pull a course. You can map it to outcomes. The outcomes have to be installed for you by an administrator. Okay. So yeah, yeah. and it's just I'm basically typing in. Yeah, it's part of the core model for many many years. Mm -hmm. It's like the newer version, whatever version. But the the, the, the Moodle rooms yeah. has like a little deluxe version, a little, little deluxe pool. Mm -hmm. pool. Yeah. Yeah. And, and for me, one of the incentives for adding the digital or tagging mine with the digital learnings was that I met with Annie. She showed me how to do that. And then I was like, oh, can you put in my biology learning outcomes? And she yeah. said yes. And I'm like, this is great. Now I can also right. tag right. those with activities and helps me assess the biology. Yeah. Yeah. And we use them across campus for accreditation and things like that. For programs, uh, they pull the reports and make sure everything is, is uh, in a program progressing correctly. Mm -hmm. No, it's, more, it's interesting about reusing Padlet to look at uh, difference of opinions, and um, I was wondering from a diversity perspective, yeah. did you did you did you tag that as as part of the diversity in the course? Mm -hmm. uh, no, but I should. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. And and I should say there were times when I made students post non-anonymously as well. Sometimes I had activities where I said, okay, go research bursitis or arthritis, or, or, you know, rheumatoid arthritis in different groups, and then post things under that um, standpoint. So you can do it non-anonymously, and then you can also do it anonymously, which I did in this case. Mm -hmm. Sometimes if I had them posting anonymously, I would say, okay, just put your name over somewhere, and I know you contributed something, and then make your comment 
uh, anonymous, but it really did. I think I have a classroom where there's a fair bit of discussion, but I think inevitably from a when I'm standing up there, students are kind of wanting, well, what does she think? Yeah. What? Yeah. Uh, and here I could just say, okay, the, here it is. I'm going to sit down. You do it. And it really, there just was much more diversity of opinion that was expressed. And I thought that was great. Yeah. Yeah. And I'd like to know more about the visual studies minor. Uh, how, did you, how did you create it? Did you have funding for that? Did you have to hire the people? Did you Anita, you want to take it? Well, um, so the, the great thing about the digital studies minor is that it actually came, it was, very, it was a very organic process. Um, we had this ad hoc faculty group um, that met with two <coughs> administrators, and of course we had the administrator support and buy-in, which is very important, but we also are a very small institution with very limited budget. So, for instance, I already have a teaching load and I teach one of the courses on the, in the minor. We, 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 at the same time as we were thinking about developing the minor was when we said we need someone to oversee this process, um, and that's when uh, we hired, when Nancy came on board, Greg was about the same time. Yep. And so, me, it, you know, you can talk about the courses you teach, um, and sure. your other roles, Right, so, uh, but tagging on what Anid is uh, explaining, um, and I think where you're, what you're asking, okay. so uh, this faculty group, a few key members, reached out to their colleagues at other institutions to try and ask, what are those uh, key technical fluencies that one needs to know? And so they identified at least one coding course. They identified uh, languages and systems understanding, uh, data analytics, and then so uh, that process was brought together. And so when my job uh, was created, it was to teach some of these uh, introductory introductions to those areas, and that's what I teach. I guess, and, and I mean, you look at institutions, um, like Bates College, right? I mean, they just had we'll hand over $19 million. I don't know if there's anybody from Bates College here, but that's awesome. So. <laughs> um, <laughs> but we certainly did not have that, you know? And so it's been very faculty-driven. I mean, we are fortunate to have the support of the administration, um, but it was minimal investment. Um, and um, it, it's hard, but, you know, we are limited in that way, but we have made great strides yeah. even still in not having a lot of new faculty. Mm -hmm. And just one thing, so I think having key, st key staff or you know faculty who people know to go to, but also sometimes people are more willing to go to the people they know in their division, so I think that's kind of one of the roles I've played is so I'm not on an ad hoc committee or you know any sort of official digital learning, but I just have this technology learning mentor, and then people in my division kind of, if they have a question, or like, oh, you know, what are you trying this semester? And it could be those informal conversations, which are cheap and actually fun for me, and not much extra work. I, probably, you know, if I had more time, I could, I could do more, right? But it's been something in a way. Yeah, can you say more about who the technology learning mentors are? Yeah. It's, Really, just one person from every division who's tagged so with one that. faculty member, <laughs> one faculty member from every division, and there are occasional meetings of not even that often of the technology learning mentors, but it kind of gives in every division. Okay, you know, this is somebody I could go to to ask my questions. And so, like, we had a new faculty member come on this year, and so when she had questions about Moodle. She came to me and I sat down with her. And then I could also refer her to, I'm not going to know all, I mean, Annie knows way more about Moodle than I do, but then I could kind of, again, give that little push of, okay, oh, I'm not sure how to do this, but you know, you should really just go talk to Annie and she can help you figure this out. Another thing, oh, sorry, no, go ahead. I was saying another thing about the technology learning mentors, mentors, which I think is great, is when we do introduce a new tool on campus or a new, Technology. 
um, they, we are trained first. The technology learning mentors are trained first. We bring that training back to our divisions. Mm -hmm. um, we also, at division meetings, hear the gripes and the, and the successes of what's going on in our particular division, and then we can take that information back to IT, which we have a relationship with since we're the, the mentors. And so we keep that conversation going, and hopefully that will help us deal with any technology snafus and also ensure everyone is trained on new tools. So, getting really technical. Yeah. So, um, what are the incentives to be a technology learning mentor, and or is that counted as service? Is it yeah, it's counted as service. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's the incentive. Yes, right. that's yeah. the carrot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the carrot. Well, yeah, that's the second. Mm -hmm. And how are you supporting students? Mm -hmm. Is it that you guys, is it just the faculty? Yeah, that's my department. I, um, I, I run the WODI, uh, Wortman Office of Digital Education, and mm -hmm. my, the people that I work with who sit in the library in the digital learning commons to support students daily, every day. Okay. They can come anytime, any day, with a laptop, with a problem, with anything, and we will help them work through it. I would say that some people take advantage of it, and a lot of them don't, and so we really work to be more in the front but putting our information out there and, and letting them know. Right. But I feel like they need the support. They, yeah. they really do. And knowing that someone is sitting there every day. Mm -hmm. It's help us. My, my question was similar to Rebecca, but maybe a little different. It was like, um, how, whether it was difficult to get the, the how do you went about, maybe you talked about this in the beginning, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. I'm this late, but like just getting this program going and getting people on board for the program and like, Areas. Well, you know they say the devil's in the details, and it sure is with digital learning. <laughs> um, it's it's a challenge. It's a challenge to uh, get students' attention because uh, digital learning is right now not part of the Gen Ed requirement. Okay. So that so this is just there's a lot of competition, and it's really a grassroots effort. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> on digital learning weeks, Annie and I will be in the cafeteria talking to individual students. Mm -hmm. We're, uh, you know, working our networks among students, and we're doing the same thing with faculty. So, I would say that slowly. Do you feel like that's kind of like implementing it? I mean, because it seems like you get a lot of college-wide buy-in mm -hmm. somehow to this program. Like yes. It's not like an easy. Well, and I, I think it because it came from both directions. I mean, we have a president who um, came from the Rochester Institute of Technology, mm -hmm. scientist, and who, you know, this is very important to him. And infusing this kind of digital learning throughout our <coughs> curriculum is important mm -hmm. to him, but also, we know, to prospective employers, right? Um, and so it was coming from him, but then we also had this organic sort of need uh, in our classrooms where we wanted to, we knew it was important to layer this kind of thinking and literacy in our own coursework. So I think it was kind of a, a perfect you know, marriage of, mm -hmm. we, we had the ear of the right people, mm -hmm. uh, this, this ad hoc work group had the ear of the right people and um, we were able to uh, incentivize in some ways. There were, there were some faculty members who got course releases to develop new courses um, or to you know, uh, experiment with new technology. Um, and so there was a lot of buy-in from the administration and the faculty early on. I mean, it's still a long and winding road, which is the yeah. definition or the title of our presentation, mm -hmm. but I think that um, everyone has seen the value of it. Mm -hmm. But to Laurel's point, now we're trying to carve out those the, the time and figure out where it's most appropriate. Um, I, I think know. as people see their peers mm -hmm. producing things, it's very motivating, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, it's it's not in a shaming way, but more of like an encouraging way. And and so the infographics thing, it, it took off. You know, two people tried it, and then yeah. three more people tried it, and now, you know, it, it, and the students, you know, and I work I work in almost every single classroom, and they'll say, I don't computer. <laughs> and I'll be like, oh yes, you can do it. And then by the end, they can do it, and they feel great reward. So and you'll start noticing too, I suspect when faculty members who aren't really connected in are doing things that might connect to your competencies yes. and say, you know, this is really a technical whatever, whatever, you know, whatever. And, and that's, a great, yeah. that's a great point because, for instance, in this digital learning working group that Nancy and I are part of, we, we are trying to figure out a way to measure 
who is doing what on yeah. doing this? Because we know some people are self-reporting, and then there's some people out here who are doing really cool stuff who are so busy doing really cool stuff they haven't let us know, you know? So yeah. it's hard. I mean, so we're, right now we're trying to figure out a way to get a better uh, grasp, an understanding of who is doing what on campus, and so we can be maybe more, um, you know, our efforts can be more efficient. So, I mean, just like hard numbers, how many classes have you checked digital art? Because it's not in the gym ed, so it's, right. Right. people just have to identify. I agree that we're doing these learning outcomes. Do you know, like? We checked 10 for this Moodle, okay. uh, because we needed to do it very deeply. We did right. it for each activity. Right. I think and there like are people that are process. applying the digital learning outcomes, but aren't necessarily tracking it in Moodle, right. mm -hmm. and, and that's what we'd like to do. So okay. uh, this slide might uh, represent yeah. us a, a little bit more favorably. So uh, on the far left, we have uh, activities in 2015 that include attending this conference. And so uh, Laurel's identification of picking up Padlet as an idea, she shares it with someone, together they present. Mm -hmm. And so in the faculty retreat last year, we represented the idea of a modified MOOC Mm -hmm. that uh, we're going to launch it this fall, and that includes uh, three other classes. And then with the ePortfolio, we've got, these are actually programs, and sociology is one of them, and also the individual classes and a few gen ed courses. So this is how we're proliferating. Yeah, no, I mean, I think the network model is exactly the way to yeah. do this. Yeah. And, you know, and again, I'm asking because we're thinking the same thing, how do you track your penetration yeah. and yeah. how you and track how far you're going. Uh, we didn't really touch on it, but those e-portfolios are are kind of the uh, push from push from under. <laughs> you know, I don't know uh, uh, because it's, because we are asking students to do it, they have to gain some skills, right? And mm -hmm. and, and so and as they gain those skills, then they're starting to transfer them to other courses. <laughs> so students, uh, professors that may have just said. Well, I just want a research paper. Somebody will say, well, you know, I can do it this way. Can I do it a different way? And, and so there's, there's, we're trying to get, get a lot less for you learn, just because I know everybody's in a small institution. When you report things out like this, and our president discovered this, um, make sure you mention how small our faculties are, mm -hmm. yeah. because yeah. Mm -hmm. it's percentage wise, oh, yeah. it's a much better story, and especially when you compare it to big institutions. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, they have these sorts of things going on, they have higher numbers, but it's a much smaller percentage. So right. when you're talking to non people, it's the same percentage. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just be Alex, did you have a comment? I, did. I was just wondering, um, you know, you mentioned things like Padlet and ePortfolio, but over the past year or so, has there been any uh, specific resources or tools that emerged that you, did, you said you do these trainings on? And who kind of provides those trainings, and were there any recently that were really inspiring that you're excited about? Yeah, we do a lot of trainings, um, a couple different ways. In fact, we retreat, people share uh, in different ways to teach and pedagogy. Um, and, and then as things surface, I add them to the digital learning page that people can go in, and it's a toolbox where you can go and find ideas. Um, some of the new tools that, that are coming across campus, we're using the Google Apps for Education extensively, and uh, we use the blogger functions and embed them into the Google Sites. And that's what we built our e-portfolios on, on the Google Sites, because they're easy. So to uh, answer your question more specifically, uh, Annie has exploded infographics yeah. uh, on campus. That's a specific tool. And, uh, and I'm using pick to chart for that, because it works in the drive. Mm -hmm. And with the SPOC, which is our modified MOOC, uh, one tool we're using is the network uh, analysis. Uh, it's called Node Excel. It's an Excel add-in, totally free. Well, uh, you need at least one pro version to uh, calculate the metrics. Uh -huh. Is it true that that's just PC as well? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah, and I guess one thing I would add, speaking to the, the money end of things, is we definitely try to, like she mentioned, we use, we're use using Google for the portfolios, things that are cheap or free. Uh, but the side benefit of that is there are also things that students are more likely to be able to use going forward. Yeah. So that when they graduate, they will still have access to these tools. So even like this video projects, you know, I had 
Um, I didn't require people to use any particular program, and then because we our emails through Google, everyone I knew could um, use the YouTube um, that comes through Google and turn their video into a link and then post that link, and then that goes across platforms. So it's both a good tool, it's something they can use going forward, and you can use it across campus so you're not learning different things in different courses. Can I, can I add one that's not cheap for free? Oh, yeah. So in my design in a digital world, world course, uh, I worked with the VPAA's office, and uh, we, we are using drones to gather aerial footage mm -hmm. to incorporate into mm -hmm. 3D design, which mm -hmm. is really fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it costs a little bit of money. It costs a little bit of money. Yeah. You only need one drone. <laughs> yeah, um, I come from a place with money, right? Okay. And, uh, but I was going to tell you that um, money really doesn't add much uh, value unless you got the pedagogical. Right? Yeah. So um, I, before the grant of fifty million was given for us to convert into blended learning, uh, we actually have been doing a lot of blended learning uh, ad hoc when uh, a professor is interested. And what I noticed was during that time, we will look for tools that are free. Mm -hmm. And we will we, we have much more intention. We were much more conscious of what we were doing. Mm -hmm. uh, and we design and we interact with, with, with the professors and, and so on. Now that we have money, now that we have money, what happens is we have vendors that come and <laughs> put you out there and just give you a presentation and this, okay, engineering, oh, we have this, we have this particular uh, system for engineering, they will just, you know, splunk in all your materials in a particular sequence that they've already done for engineering. There's much less invention. Mm -hmm. It might appear more professional. You have your you have your caricatures, you have your cartoons, you have your uh, videos. But if you ask me whether it was uh, uh, well thought of, no. Mm -hmm. In the original process of creating, which is why when you have less resources, you are actually more thoughtful. Mm -hmm. So don't, uh, I, I'm an optimist. So look at it from that particular <laughs> perspective. <laughs> I love that. Thank yeah. you for sharing. That was great. Very encouraging. Yes, yes. Uh, no, um, so I, it looks all very interesting. I was session jumping, so I missed part of it. I was, I looked. At, you had a link for a the digital toolkit on Google Sites. Yeah. Uh, but that is uh, not set to public. Um, uh, I can set that to public. Oh. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I'll set the public. It's not a problem. It's uh, basically it took our seven standards, mm -hmm. and I um, put in the pedagogy behind the reasoning for each one, and then I linked tools that would match it. Mm -hmm. So, for example, it says research and information fluency, and I put in Nomia and um, gosh, I can't think what else is in there, but things that help you do research. Um, mm -hmm. And the links to our Google pages and things like that that, that lead students through it. So ways to like Mind Master. Somebody said yesterday I use uh, Mind Mappers and things like that. So I put all those Mind Mapper tools in there. So I'll, I'll put that out there. I'd love for people to to use it. It would be it would be nice. <laughs> so one question that I hear when uh, we talk about you know, uh, especially from the more IT side of of the house um, when we introduce faculty to these new tools and things like that is like oh my god how can we support that you know I don't know how to do this and I don't understand that mm -hmm. shouldn't we pick one and, and really support it so what what has yeah. been your sort of um, both from your team that's having to do the support and sort of your, your mindset around that how, how choosing tools or, or just that I'm if I show them all these tools oh. and they start using them, mm -hmm. you know, my team can't adequately no. right. support right. that. We're worried. Right. No, about that. Right. Well. You know what? I I um I always look at if it works with the drive. I always keep going to Moodle to Google, and I don't choose things that don't work that way. Mm -hmm. So um, that way. Uh, I make sure it exports to the drive or it, it pulls from the drive, and then it has to link to Moodle in some way. So I always put the link into the tool in Moodle. So I'm a one-stop shop, and I want a department store in Moodle, right. but they can go in and get everything from, and then they can go to the special places, and that's that's my thing. And then with IT, you know, we don't buy a lot of uh, pieces, but I would say if you do have money, the newest thing for the Google Apps thing is the Hapara. H-A-R-H-A-P-A-R-A, 
It is a aggregating tool that pulls all the shared documents to the teacher that it's shared with, and they click on that, and it opens all the, the squares of the shared documents. So if you're at Google School and you have a little money, it's, it makes life in the Google world a little simpler for the instructor. For, for strategies also, and you can uh, hopefully uh, uh, tell me this is still the case, but we actually move to when new faculty come in, mm -hmm. now all the um, human resource information on their benefits and stuff is on Moodle. Mm -hmm. so, uh, yeah. It's still the case. We just and so that people not, yeah. who come yeah. in who maybe have never used Moodle, I mean, people want to find out about what are their health insurance. Yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> and so they yeah. have to log on to Moodle and go there right from the get-go. Mm -hmm. And that's another kind of little push, mm -hmm. I guess, that yeah. helps to the Chocolate started. is a good thing. I always <laughs> Do you have to student orientation? Yeah, you have I, I do. Yeah, we have that built for the CPS faculty, the yeah. adult faculty, uh, the adult students, sorry. Right. Center for Professional Studies. And we're doing like our, like all of our orientation materials for all new students. Yes. Is now in Canvas. Yes. And we're tri we really cleaned that up. We've added it, we've updated it, made it really um, better looking and very interactive. And uh, we grouped it. Um, so when you go in for your major, it's grouped for your major. And um, you have to take a little uh, quizzy kind of thing at the end, and then it gives you a badge. It gives mm -hmm. you badges. I'm, I'm setting up games and badges on those pages. Mm -hmm. So um, some of the pages, like the information literacy page that the students do, they earn, try to gamify it a little bit. They get a badge, research warrior, and this big hulking mm -hmm. guy comes up, and then it disappears. <laughs> and they, I, yeah. is it make it better? I don't know, but it's they chuckle. Yeah. Yeah. That, I guess is my it's small reward. <laughs> Though about strategy and when the faculty come to you with all these different kinds of ideas. I, I think one of the things that I have found that has allowed me to be successful is that I go out and I find a tool that works for me. Mm -hmm. And you know what? My students are doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. And so for me and to for, for, yeah. yeah, and so yeah. for me to force them to use a particular mm -hmm. site or a particular mm -hmm. tool is really doing them a disservice mm -hmm. once they leave these four walls, so right? Have it. Right, and so Tim Sellers, our, our associate VP, who's been a big driving force behind all of this, always says we are a device agnostic campus. Mm -hmm. Whatever you bring, we will make it work, right? Mm -hmm. So um, so I think that is really important because if we try to force everything into this neat, you know, no, yeah. no disrespect to Moodle, but if we try to force everything into this neat package, I, I feel we're doing them a disservice. And so, when I do come up with a new tool that works for me, I share it with them, but I say, the reason this tool works is because it does X, Y, and Z. Yeah. Not because it is a particular tool. Right. Right. Free is good, yeah. always. Because Free is always good. Right. Right. And things change constantly. Right. Right. Things change constantly. Right. 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 Free changes constantly. Right. The way things sign on changes constantly. Free. Yeah. And now free again. Right. Yeah. 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 It's very hard. Yeah. So, so it's yeah. important that they can make good choices. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Yeah. The, it, it's funny, you, you mentioned that because in the, the session next door, they were talking about that very same thing, and they were talking about in a media literacy course that they designed a project that was a semester-long project, uh, and they, they looked at all these tools, and they thought Microsoft OneNote of all tools mm -hmm. uh, was the one that would be most effective, mm -hmm. and so they built their... Uh, the, the whole project around uh, OneNote. And when they did uh, check in something close to mid semester, they found that people just were not, there was no presence of any sort of work being done, and they freaked out. And it turns out that the student groups uh, were doing the work in Google Docs. Yeah. So, yeah. And the term, I, I hadn't heard this, uh, he described that as path dependence, that, oh, yeah, that people yeah. use, you mm -hmm. know, they, they understand the, the work product that, that I'm supposed to produce and I'm going yeah. to use the, the tool that's most yeah. familiar to me. Yeah. And I think it depends on that school. If they're using Microsoft 365, that OneNote is the key. It is so strong. But I mean, I'm cloud-based, and I try to put everything in the cloud as much as possible. I would have recommended Evernote or something similar to that, which is a little more um, agnostic and easy to get to. Works with everything. We actually, for our global learning fit system, have come up with these criteria which you can pull. And you guys have mentioned all of them. It's, you know, ubiquitous access across all kinds of devices, including mobile, mm -hmm. um, which means it's got to be cloud-based. 
It's got to work well on different size screens. Um, it's got to be something they can take with them, right? We want tools that they will be able to use, and we really are trying to develop them in the sense of how do you pick tools because these are going to go away anyway. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So trying to develop that kind of resilience, and then as much as possible, we try to get things that integrate because we want them to realize that kind of integration is something they want. You did the same thing. Um, yeah. Are you familiar with um, resources like Code Academy and Linda? Do you <laughs> kind of encourage students to explore those as like? Kind of, a, you give them a jumping mm -hmm. off. And I did Khan Academy this semester, and it was awesome. We did coding on it for uh, two weeks, and they, they did well. They did really well. I love the tracking function. I love that I can see exactly where they are and exactly how much time they spent and the energy form they earned. Mm -hmm. Just is a really great analytical device, and um, I can check in while I'm checking in. Mm -hmm. Linda's been a good resource. I teach a lot of digital design courses, and so. Um, I see what works for me when I go to Linda for a refresher, and then I duplicate and create my own tutorials for, for my students because then I can put them on Moodle and make sure they watch them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, with some low stakes quizzes. So, um, but yeah, those are great resources. We have, you know, subscriptions to Linda. Yeah, I find that very valuable too when I get brought into classrooms to do demos, and usually there's only 15 or 20 minutes for me to do a demo on a piece of software. There's only so much I can cover right. in that 15 or 20 minutes. Right, yeah. And being able to say, oh, we have this wonderful resource that you can mm -hmm. go home and explore mm -hmm. as much as you want. Uh, yeah. it's and because you have such a variety of different levels, yeah. people have touched that software before. In some cases, in some cases, they haven't. In some cases, they're, mass, you know, they're much more competent. So it's hard to, mm -hmm. to adjust that training, I'm sure, for a diverse group of people. Well, I just put screencasts on a lot of people's pages with, the little, with me just talking through it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you use? Do you use Camtasia? For yeah. No, I use a Jing or I use Screencastify, which works in Chrome, or the new one is Cam uh, Camnista. And I just I just kind of click through. Those Chrome ones work really well. I go through a whole session in my class and we just do add-ons in that app. Camtasia has come a long way. It's I, great. I actually teach it for video essays, too, in classes. Mm -hmm. um, and so not actually using the screencasting function, but just importing media into mm -hmm. the software and using it at a time, you know, just time have, base have have free. And, and you showed me how to use QuickTime. Huh? Yep, QuickTime. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah. Um, Longer time than five minutes. I liked when you guys were talking too about the ePortfolio and thinking about can they take it with them. Um, our education monitor, um, they're preparing students who will go out to be teachers and they're very conscious of technology and its impact on K-12 education. And so they have courses about this and get students thinking of it. Also, these students have to demonstrate competency in like four of the key areas, mm -hmm. and so they're organizing their portfolio with licensing in mind about how am I going to demonstrate competency. But one of the things that they do is they say you can make it in any platform mm -hmm. you want, and part of the exercise is reflecting on here's the platform I chose mm -hmm. and why. Mm -hmm. And some of it, it has to do with you know are you doing mm -hmm. images or are you doing this or you know you know what's what's your what were your criteria. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it, I think it just adds that extra level of sort of this digital component. Yeah. To great. I think yeah. it goes right along with the um, sh the developing uh, competent mastery. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the platform that I kind of chose for the university was Google Sites because it's easy to share inside mm -hmm. and it's easy to keep private uh -huh. and easy to develop. And then in the end, um, we hope that students will have four or five portfolios, one for English, one for art, you know, one for field period. Um, and then in the end, you can easily take that HTML code and paste it into Weebly, paste it into something else. Um, in my experiences of letting them choose, they hit roadblocks that they don't realize when they start to build it. And as soon as you put a YouTube video in there, oh, it's a dollar a month. Yeah, you know, and, and those kinds of things frustrate them. And so, if I can keep it right. in my department store for a little while, then you can go out and work up to it. Yeah, to the ability, ability levels that. of building it, right. and making it even look more beautiful on Weebly. I mean, Google Sites is, is, is 